evening and welcome to Information Please, your Peoria Public Library on the air, bring you information about your library and your community. And this evening my guest is our Police Chief Steve Steddingsgard. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I know how busy you are and I'm so excited that you're going to take time to talk to us. But we go back a little ways because of our Peoria Reads project with the book Don't Shoot. And this is kind of... Um, what I understand was rather a unique way to launch this program that's been so successful, successful with having the community read the book before too much went on. So it's been a year and a couple of months now. Um, how mm -hmm. are things going? I, I think we're starting to hit our stride now. And what you mentioned is true. The, the way we got involved in a focused deterrence strategy is kind of different than the way a lot of cities do. Um, we did start with the book. And, you know, it happened that Tate Chambers brought the book back from Washington, D.C. and, and uh, handed it to the mayor and the state's attorney and the sheriff and I and said, you know, you, you guys really have to read this. And, and he, the message he brought back was that the Department of Justice had determined that, that focus deterrence, what we call don't shoot mm -hmm. in Peoria, is the one strategy that actually has success around the country that actually appears to work and be worth the investment of the grants and and the projects under DOJ. Um, we are hitting our stride now. We, you know, we spent the first year learning it. I mean, we started, yeah. and you said we did it differently, and we did. We kind of launched into it, and then had to learn it as we go, mm -hmm. and and made some mistakes along the way, had some successes along the way. But um, we've been working closely with John Jay College, which is where uh, Professor Kennedy is from. And we're really, I think we're really going to hit our stride now. We're going to, we're going to go into a, um, a schedule of call-ins so that every three or four months we're going to run another call-in and reinforce the message, reinforce the message, and, and keep doing that over and over again um, as, as long as the strategy continues to work. Great. Well, we were lucky because we did get to have Professor Kennedy come here. And, of course, the library still... You know, we have plenty of copies of this and people who are interested and want to know what it's all about and how it works and how this was developed can come and check it out. We have a link on our webpage to the main site and people are still actively using that. We're getting a lot of hits, hundreds of hits a month. So people are still interested. But if someone hasn't read the book and somehow they've missed what's behind this, do you want to give us a little short description of how this program works? I can, I can. But I would, I would say that people do ask me to explain it. Yeah, and, and <laughs> it's I, difficult. It is difficult. I can't explain it as well as the author does. And, yeah. And my response is usually, take the, take the time and read the book, and you will, you will know, you'll know really the, the philosophy the way I know it. But in a nutshell, um, what you're doing is your, your you're relying or you're debunking some common myths about about who these young men are mm -hmm. and why they do what they do and 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 the fact that they are not true that these urban legends I'll call them are not true is how this can be successful one is that they don't like who they are yeah. um, and that is a common belief especially among law enforcement it was one of the things I struggled with early on that this notion that they enjoy belonging to gangs that they're they're as tough as the persona that mm -hmm. that they put on the mask they wear, that they don't want anything different, that they enjoy their lifestyle. Um, another urban legend is, is that they're not afraid, that they're not, they're not afraid of anything. And the truth is they're afraid of everything. Yeah. Um, so we, we approach that. And, and the, another principle is that they, they act like, they act like businessmen in many ways. You know, they, they are, they may not be well educated, generally speaking, but they're mm -hmm. typically very intelligent. Particularly the particularly the young men that are that are leading these organizations. Yeah. Um, they do cost benefit analysis the way a business does, and they determine what's profitable and what's not. And and one of the one of the facets of of focus deterrence is you make it you make it obvious to them that that the best way to continue in whatever lifestyle they choose is to put guns down. And so we, we, the process is we demonstrate to, to gang members in the city that mm -hmm. if, if we put the attention of all of the law enforcement community on one single gang, we can have a tremendous impact. We can't 
we can't track all of them at all times. Yeah. But if we say we're gonna we're gonna go after this one particular gang, from the feds, the state, the local folks, we can we can really hit you with a pretty big hammer. The next piece is that that you have the opportunity to not have that happen, and that and the way you do that is you put your guns down. And but for those that continue to shoot, this is what will happen. The the outcome the the what we've seen in successes across the country is that is that gang members are intelligent enough to know that when they when they see it's legit when they see when they see gangs in this in their community um, getting that focus attention and being indicted in mm -hmm. federal crimes and state crimes the light bulb does go off and and that they say to themselves you know this this isn't a smart way for us to do business if we're going to sell drugs if we're going to do whatever it is we do the smart thing is to put the guns away and and then you avoid that kind of scrutiny um, we also do something that I think we've never done in law enforcement. You know, for a long time we've talked about. We use the words that we wanted to help and we care about these young men, right. but we really had no way to demonstrate it. And this is finally a way to demonstrate that we really want to make a difference and we want them to walk away from the lifestyle. And we offer help, mm -hmm. and we don't hand them a we don't hand them a sheet of phone numbers that says. You know, Which is the usual yeah, thing that right. happens. You get a booklet or a pamphlet, and it will have all kinds of social service agencies and, and phone numbers listed. Well, you know, these young men come from pretty dysfunctional backgrounds, and right. they're, not, they're not going to make those phone calls. Mm -hmm. what, you, what they have to have is one person, one contact, and we provide that one contact who will sit on. Um, we, had, we had, I think, eight eight gang members from the last call and have already come forward. Mm -hmm. our, our, our gal, Krista Coleman, sits down with them and she goes through a needs assessment with each individual and, and mm -hmm. determine what do they need. Do they need a GED? Do they need job training? Do they need soft skills training? Do, right. Can they read? Yeah, that's a huge... It's a huge... Yeah, if you give somebody a pamphlet of, right. of numbers, if you can't even read it, you're not going to get anywhere. So we, we identify, do they have alcohol? abuse problem, mm -hmm. uh, substance abuse, drugs? Do they have children that, that need to be cared for that aren't being cared for? Do they have transportation problems? We drill down and we try and find something to help them with all of those obstacles that, that are in their way. And, and we have some young men that are really working hard at being something other than what they've been. And you know the, the value of that I think is exponential when if, if a single young man gives up the gang lifestyle, walks away from the drug dealing and the, and the gun violence, gets that education, learns how to read, gets some job skill training, actually goes to work at a, in a job that, is, that, that pays enough to support a family, um, you know, becomes somebody that their mother's proud of, that their family's proud of. Right. The impact on their children and, and their grandchildren mm -hmm. is where I think over the years you'll really see the benefit. Yeah, it's, it's that drop of ink in the water that can spread right. not only to other people they know, but to the breaking that whole chain. And we've tried so many things in this community to break that chain. And this in-depth, focused approach is probably the one thing that might work this time. I, I have a lot of confidence in it. Um, you know, we've learned we, we're not going to arrest our way out of this. Mm -hmm. It hasn't worked. You know, just locking, locking up all the young men that are, that are running in this lifestyle is not going to be the answer. No. I've come to that conclusion. What we have unique, uniquely in our favor in Peoria is everybody who is a player in criminal justice is on board, and we're all, we're all pulling in the same direction, which is difficult, difficult to find that scenario in, yeah. in cities across America where the state's attorney and the U.S. attorney and the chief and the sheriff and the mayor and, and everybody who needs, to, who needs to get on board yes. can all sit in the room together, all agree this is our, this is our strategy. Mm -hmm. We had no money. Um, that was, we, we joked that it was a curse and a blessing. Yeah. And a lot of times when you start something like this, you start with a grant. Yes. <laughs> you apply for a grant. You've applied for grants. You've told me that. Yes. And it's a yes. difficult process. It is. But... You know, it's a blessing to have money, that you can get things done, you have the funds to pay for staff mm -hmm. and other things, but the curse of it is that when, when you invite people to the table and there's money on the table, 
My experience is when the money dries up, everybody they all disappears. disappear. And and the advantage we had is we had no money. When we started on this, we had we didn't have a nickel. We didn't have any grant money. We didn't have any money allocated for it. We just decided that we needed to do this because it was the right thing to do and, and to commit the resources we currently have to get it done. And mm -hmm. and I'm really I'm really excited about some of the early feedback and some of the early successes. That's great. Was that sort of partnership going on before you all agreed to work on Don't Shoot? It was. The, or did it, did when, it, when it I arrived happened? In, when I arrived in May of 05, the mayor was just being sworn in as the mayor. Mm -hmm. And he, he pulled all of us together in a room to talk about crime and, and to come up with ideas and solutions. And we've done some other things together. But he started to build that relationship back then. And that's really carried us forward to the day that the day that we read that book, mm -hmm. we already had a close relationship and a close working relationship. The sheriff and I have a great relationship, um, and that's very uncommon. Yeah. I think that may surprise people, but I would venture to say in most communities, um, you don't see sheriffs and police chiefs really cooperating very well. You know, there's egos getting in the way. And yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's political. And it, it is. It is political, particularly in a... In territorial a, in a location where the local municipal police department is as large or even larger than the sheriff's staff mm -hmm. then then you really do get into these you know political battles kind of and blad for, well battles well, well it's kind of a struggle for resources too probably because everybody's trying to do their job and they have the perception that perhaps if they had these resources you do, I could do a better job here. So it's because the kind of cooperation we have here creates that synergy that no one's struggling over the resources so you can all focus on it together, which that's, is a great thing. That's and of course the library that. didn't have any resources to do, no, you know, Peoria no. Reads when we did this. And so we were, you know, we just kind of like the library always does, pull it up out of nowhere and <laughs> just we have talented staff and we have people who can go out and talk and, you know, get the library, of course, and you get a few copies, you share them. And so that, was, the that same... was huge for us for the launch. And, and it kind of goes yeah. towards what I was saying. When, when we got people to the table, we knew they were there because they wanted to make a difference, not yes. because there was money. And, and, the, right. and the library was one. Peoria Reads was huge for us. Mm -hmm. They, they were willing to help and, and, and wanted to contribute. And so um, we were able to roll that out publicly even before a lot of the police work was, was being done. Yeah. So people kind of were aware of what was coming. And I, th I think that as, as a public relations person, I think that was a great way to start to educate people first. And I think that Professor Kennedy was impressed by that too when he, he talked to us and thought that was a unique way to do things. So that was great. Yeah, he did mention that, yes. Yeah. But there's more than just don't shoot going on in Peoria. Let's um, talk about one of the recent concerns is about burglaries and break-ins. And I don't think that probably has much to do with gangs, does it? Or what's your perception of what's happening? You know, uh, it's it's connection to gangs is unknown right now. Um, my my guess is that it's probably not closely tied to gang activity. Uh, what we may find, though, when the suspects are identified, and I'm pretty confident that they will be identified, um, you may find some gang affiliation or some former gang affiliation. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not likely to be um, men who don't have extensive arrest records. What we have, what we have, we have a crew of of men, three or four men that are that are targeting um, middle to upper middle and, and, and I guess even wealthy mm -hmm. uh, level homes to do home invasions in the middle of the night. They enter the house very quietly through an open window or an open door. They are um, securing the victims, uh, tying them up and, and going through their house and taking valuables and, and uh, cash and, and credit cards and debit cards and things. And, and even leaving in the victim's cars when they when they leave the scene. We're we're making progress in the case. We don't have suspects identified yet or in custody yet. But I have a I have a team of individuals who are doing nothing but home invasion work. I have a a lieutenant. I have a sergeant. I have detectives assigned. Mm -hmm. I have extra officers being hired at night to 
to patrol the tar, you know, the areas that have been affected uh, by these home invasions. And, and we're confident we are going to make this case, um, it's, but it's a slow process. They've been a, they've been a, a relatively professional team in, in, the, in the way they go about their business. And, um, but everybody makes mistakes and, yeah. and we key on those. <laughs> everybody does. Yeah. yeah, and I have always wondered since this started happening if these are a team of people that came from somewhere else, you know, if, if there's been any indication that they've, you know, traveled around the country and, you know, just moved to different areas and do this. Is there any indication of something like that? Well, we asked that same question because these kind of appeared out of nowhere, and yeah. and and they are highly unusual. I've been in, I've been in law enforcement over thirty years, and and mm -hmm. I've never seen this before, where where a crew's going into a house. You sh typically, when you have a home invasion case, there's some connection between the victim and the suspects, right. and, and quite often there's there's a you know a criminal connection. Yeah, many times. Um, Drug dealers are victims of home invasions. Crews come in, tie them up, take their drugs, take their money. I heard um, that speculation after the very first one that, that there was something like criminal going on. But then as this is repeated, everybody's now saying, now just, you know, word on the street when you're talking over the coffee machine, people are saying, oh, no, this is something else. These are just professionals. A lot of people talk about the Home Alone Christmas movie with the... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that that's what it seems like. Well, I think this is something else. You know, and we looked mm -hmm. at, we looked for connections through these cases. And, sure. And we look for similarities, commonalities, and, and we still are looking for those. Um, sometimes what you'll find in a spree like this is that victims are being identified by some relationship, some commonality between victims that they're not even aware of. It might be, it might be a housekeeper. It might be lawn maintenance staff. And I don't mean to, I don't mean to, to no, cast not. any aspersions. Well, it could be they all industries. go to the same restaurant on Sunday morning. Right. Could be they they have a same. It could it could be something as crazy as they they visit the same dentist and yeah. and in that office there's a there's mm -hmm. a. A secretary or staff member that works in that office who who has a relationship a boyfriend who's in this business in the criminal business and yeah. and they start to identify victims that way so we're we've gone through each victim with a very detailed questionnaire to find out mm -hmm. you know we're looking for any any similarity between cases that to, to identify why them um, yeah, why these particular people what triggered right. them as why those houses as, each case so far, though, they've entered through an unlocked window or unlocked door. So it's critical that, that those things be locked. This, this crew is operating and, and very dependent upon um, surprise. You know, yeah. they, they move through the house quietly. They surprise the victims while the victims are asleep. So they don't make noise. They don't, they don't want to be, um, I don't want to use the word identified, but they don't, want, they don't want the victim to be aware of their presence until they're ready. And, and I think they avoid confrontations with victims that way. So locking doors, making it difficult to get into the house is important. Um, alarm systems, what we're, what we're seeing too is some folks have alarm systems, but don't turn them on mm -hmm. unless they're gone. Yeah. You know, you, you leave the home and I think that intuitively that's when you turn on your burglar alarm is when you're not home. Um, but we're suggesting that people turn, arm, arm their alarm systems when they go to bed at night. So if a window opens or a door opens, they're made aware of that. What about dogs? I'm a great believer in dogs as oh, alarm I systems. I am too. I have two large dogs at home. And, <laughs> so do I. And I, I personally think dogs are the best, are the best burglary prevention. The, it, you can sneak into a home and surprise a homeowner asleep. Mm -hmm almost impossible to surprise a dog. Anyone who owns a dog knows they, yeah. they sense and hear things long before we do. And I, and I don't think you can, you can crawl through a window or open a patio door that a dog doesn't know something's wrong. <laughs> so, and they bark and they go, to the, they go to the suspicious noise. None of our cases so far have been, have been cases with dogs in the home. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe they know that too. <laughs> they, dogs aren't right for everybody, but no. But, but if you're a dog lover, they can help. Dogs yeah. are dogs are really uh, yeah. a great insurance policy against some of those things. Yeah. Once in a great while, you'll see a case where a burglar will come in, 
and particularly with a very small dog, they'll lock a small dog away. Mm -hmm. um, larger dogs, um, e very even more rare than that. But but really, any dog is is a good way to to know when things are are, are happening right. that are not right. And they're yes. and they're and they're great at even at perception. You know, they they have the right instincts for that. Yeah. Well, moving on from that, what are some other things that your department's doing? in Peoria just in general to fight crime and the, bi the big picture. We've got some other cool things happening. Um, we're, I just left a meeting a short while ago with, with representatives from a company called ShotSpotter and um, the City Council approved the funding to bring in this ShotSpotter technology mm -hmm. into a um, portion of Peoria where we have the highest degree of gunfire. And it, what it is, it's a list, it's a a series of monitors that hear gunfire, they sense gunfire, um, they analyze, the system analyzes it, knows the difference between to, between um, fireworks and, and cars backfiring and construction noise. It, it triangulates the location of gunfire between its multiple sensors. It sends the, the information to the company, and this all happens over seconds. Right. An analyst with the company looks at it, determines that it is gunfire, and what will happen is um, a police officer is driving in their car in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Shot rings out, maybe let's say a mile or two away, mm -hmm. too far to even, even for the officer to hear it. What's going to happen is on their, on their laptop inside the patrol car, they're going to get a, a gunfire alert that will come right to their computer, and, and on that alert will be a, an aerial photograph of the location where the shot came from with a dot on the map indicating the location of the shot. So an officer will, will know that a shot was fired or multiple shots. He'll know about where it happened to a, and it's accurate to about 20 meters. Okay. So if an officer, an officer will go to that spot and that's your starting place. To, to try and find evidence, try and find a victim, et cetera. What, what we've seen nationally is, is cities bring in gunfire detection technology. They learn that, that only as, as low as 5%, typical is more like 20%. 20% mm -hmm. of the gunfire gets reported. So in a city like Peoria, if that statistic proves to be true, um, only one in five times that someone fires a gun in the city does anyone call. Wow. So we, if, that, if that's true, we know 20% of, of the actual gunfire. In an area where shot spot's going to cover that area, you're mm -hmm. going to be 90%. 90% uh, of the gunfire you'll become aware of. And that helps us know where it's coming from. It helps us identify suspects. It will help us save a tremendous amount of time in searching Right. Searching crime scenes. We, we spend a lot of time now if, um, let's say you hear a gunfire at night. And right. you, you do call 911 and, you, and typically you got a general sense of direction maybe where yeah. it comes from. Police have to go out and look and, and we'll, spend, we'll spend hours with multiple officers searching the grass for shell casings. <laughs> sometimes for a shot that never occurred. Yeah. This helps us to know when it's real. Um, it helps us to know the starting place. It'll help us get there quicker. And, and one of the really neat things, when I was a young officer, and, and this is still true today, but, but I think back when I was on patrol, and, and probably a lot of people don't realize this, they go to a, they go to a call, some anonymous call. I hear mm -hmm. gunshots in my neighborhood. And they'll go look, and they do a, do a decent job of looking, but don't really have an exact spot to search. They look until they're satisfied they've done at least a reasonable job of, of searching and then they, they get back in their car and they tell the dispatcher they're available for another call. Yeah. And it you always have this nagging thought in the back of your head that I hope I hope tomorrow morning there's not a body laying somewhere that I yes. missed. And it, it's a fear that you live with that every every call like that that you don't find evidence, you you think to yourself. Oh, I imagine. Well, I hope there's nothing here. Well, so um, I think if someone is shot, and so often, you know, it seems like we see in the news, oh, you know, somebody found this person in the morning or whatever, and maybe that will will help too. Plus, help us, help us seems know like it would give you more of a jump on catching whoever was doing the shooting. It does. 
who also help us disprove false complaints. We get a mm -hmm. fair number of, of people who show up at hospitals with, with um, firearm injuries who lie to us about yes. where it occurred, <laughs> when it occurred, who was there, how they got shot. You know, so many times it's, I was walking down the street minding my own business and I and heard a gunshot shot me. and next thing you know I, I'm struck in the leg. And when we find out the truth, the truth is either they shot themselves by accident or they were in an argument and, and there was gunfire between two people and, and we end up not getting the truth. This is another, another way that technology can help us when we're lied to, to be able to determine and get to the truth quicker. That's great. It is, it's going to be, is. we're really excited about that. Yeah, yeah, that should make a huge difference in things. Well, we just have about a minute left. Is there, um, one question I'd like to ask you is, so often people say to me, I'm not going to go to that downtown library because there's too many scary people and it's dangerous. Do you think Peorians should be afraid to come to the downtown library? No, we're, no, we're I We're open don't. 9 to 6, Monday through Saturday. <laughs> I, I don't have... I don't have any fear. I wouldn't, when my son, my son's off to college now, but when he was here as a high school and middle school student, I didn't have any problem with him going to the downtown library. It's very safe in downtown Peoria, and particularly, particularly during the day and early evening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're out at, at 3 a.m. on a Saturday night on Main Street, are you going to see noise and, you know, some, some degree of disturbance related to bars closing, you're going to see that. But but to come to the downtown library on a, you know, in a, at four o'clock in the afternoon or six o'clock in the evening is not a problem. The perception, unfortunately, perception, when crime is up, crime is up. When yeah. crime is down, it's still up because <laughs> perception doesn't seem to follow reality. Um, crime, crime peaked in the United States and peaked in Peoria in the in the late '80s and early '90s. It is much safer today than it was 25 years ago. Great. People, I think people don't realize that. The perception's mm -hmm. not, not following that reality, but it is reality. Thank you. That is reassuring. You're welcome. <laughs> and we're done, and so thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week on Information, Please.